Welcome to Immigration Quick Take. This is Ellie Rutledge with the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Documents obtained this week show that the U.S. government is refusing to allow release on bond of Central American mothers and children who have fled the violence in their home countries or is setting the bonds excessively high. Here to discuss the new bond rule is Laura Lichter, past president of AILA. Laura, thank you for joining us from Artesia, where you are on the ground providing pro bono services for these refugees. First, let's start with why the U.S. government is refusing bond. Once these women managed to climb through every hurdle and every obstacle that has been put in their way, and against all odds, managed to successfully pass a credible fear interview or have a negative credible fear determination reversed by an immigration judge. They're eligible for bond at this point. Not only they're eligible for bond, according to the government's own policies, their own guidance, they are supposed to favor the release of people either on their own recognizance or at a minimum on a de minimis bond unless there are some other specific adverse issue related to that individual case. What we're seeing now is that people who have passed their credible fear and are served with an NTA are served at the same time with a notice of custody redetermination and they're being told that they will not be released on bond. They're essentially being told that they are such a security risk that they're in the same class of aliens that have serious felonies and violent criminal histories. The government is opposing bond in all of these cases quite aggressively. They are presenting a very thick packet of memoranda, affidavits, and news stories, which they're using to base their argument that releasing any of these individuals is per se a national security risk. The argument being that if anyone is actually released from custody, that this will somehow only encourage more people to come to this country. These women and children are fleeing horrific conditions in their home countries. And no amount of legal wrangling at this stage of the game is going to change the numbers of people that are coming to this country. And then they're also saying that all of these people must be flight risks because the minute they get out, then they'll never show back up again for an immigration hearing. And we know this is just flat out untrue. The statistics in this area of law are incredibly clear. Asylum seekers, more so than almost any other respondents appearing before an immigration judge, have an incredible rate of showing up for their immigration proceedings. The mid to high 90s, and especially when these people are uh, connected with legal services providers, and other support services, those numbers go up as high as 97 and 98 percent. But yet the other complication we're seeing is that the immigration judges are holding people to incredibly high standards in these bond hearings. We had a bond hearing earlier in the week where a woman explained that she was going to be joining her father who has residency and provided proof of that, a driver's license, etc. The immigration judge denied bond there was no evidence that she herself was a flight risk. There was no evidence that she would present any danger to the community. But the IJ decided that because she hadn't produced a birth certificate showing that this individual was actually her father, and because the address on the individual's driver's license didn't match their actual home address where this individual was going to be staying, that she was a flight risk. Thanks, Laura. What are the consequences for not allowing release on bond for these refugees? And if these individuals are not released by the government, or not granted a low bond, or maybe not granted a bond at all by an immigration judge, that means that they're going to remain in this makeshift deportation camp here in the desert in Artesia. We're desperate for attorneys. We're desperate for time to prepare these cases. Asylum law is one of the most complicated areas of immigration laws. It takes dozens of hours to correctly, properly prepare these cases. And by not allowing the release, we are not only compounding the human misery of these women being trapped here with their children in quite less than ideal and certainly not residential conditions, but we are preventing them from getting the legal services that they need 
to be able to bring these cases forward in a manner where they can be fully heard and fairly adjudicated. What can ALA members do? There are lots of things you can do to help. If you have the time and you have the ability, please consider coming and volunteering down here in Artesia. People are desperate for lawyers. Um, you can contact AILA. We're organizing volunteers to actually come and do direct, in, direct representation, screening of these cases, pulling together briefs, pulling together information packets. If you can't make it down to Artesia, and we know everybody can't just drop their office for a week at a time, we understand that. But consider volunteering your time as a mentor. Consider taking some of these cases if, God willing, we actually get them out on bond. Consider providing us with any of your good materials that you have on successful uh, cases from these countries, cases involving particular social groups where the social group involves domestic violence or family violence, people suffering from gang violence. Those are going to be critical resources. Ayla is going to organize and help distribute this information. But maybe the best thing people can do is be aware of what's going down, going on down here and talk about it and let people know that this is, this is not okay. This is not who we are. This is, this is not our concept of due process. Thank you, Laura, for joining us. For the rest of you, please stay tuned for more updates from the American Immigration Lawyers Association.